So I would like to welcome again everyone on behalf of Seed Business School. Um, I'm Andras Karpati and together with Tomas, this time we will be your host today. Today is our eighth and final event of our webinar series. We have started early May. I would like to remind those who were here with us on one or more of our previous sessions uh, and also tell those who are here with us for the first time that all of the events are recorded and they are available on our website in case you have missed them or would like to watch them again. Before we start today's session, uh, and for those who are here for the first time, uh, let me briefly go through some technical information. We have now muted your microphones, but during the session, you are free to ask any questions via the chat icon at the bottom of the screen. And you can also let us know if you face any technical issues. Following the presentation, there will be a moderated Q&A session where I will read your questions and Tomas will answer them directly. In case we'll have time, we would also like to open the floor for live questions with your voice and camera on. So in case, if, so in case you would like to ask a question that way, please click on raise hand under the participant list and I will give you the word during the Q&A session. Please also note that your names or device names are visible to everyone. If you want to change your name, you, you may do so under the three dots next to your current name. For seeing the slides better, you can minimize the participant window in the top right corner. At the end of the session, as usual, we would like to ask your quick opinion about how much did you enjoy the, web, the, the, the webinar. So make sure to stick around for a few seconds at the end. As usual, we plan to finish around 5 p.m. But as always, depending on your questions and the discussion, we are, discussion, we are happy to stay with you for another 10 or 15 minutes. And now let me introduce today's topic and presenter. Today's webinar looks ahead in the future when meetings with more than just two people will be part of our normal business lives again. Oftentimes, middle management members are called in to present one single item on the agenda of a top management committee, hence the title of this webinar. Since our presenter has ample experience in both sides of this critical situation, he is guiding the audience through practical tricks in preparation and delivery so that everyone facing such a task can succeed. And our presenter is Tomasz Bernat, who is a seasoned professional in banking and consulting, uh, with the additional benefit of starting his career as a trainer for several years after graduation. Recently, he has been a transformative chairman and CEO of MFB, Hungarian Development Bank. Before that, he had leadership positions at finance corporates like OTP Bank, Astor Bank, or BMP Paribas and that consulting companies such as McKinsey, Scale, or PwC. Tomás also has an MBA degree from INSEAD and is now the chairman and CEO of Open in Holding. He's an active faculty member of Seed Business School since 2016. And Tomás, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much and welcome everybody to this webinar. Uh, I have to admit I feel a bit like a radio host because uh, I'm accustomed to speaking to people, but I'm not accustomed to speaking to people without seeing them. However, I, I feel that there might be a way to actually make sure that you are listening and this little trick will be a poll. A little poll on this situation that Andras has already described, which is essentially when you are on the agenda. When you are on the agenda means when you have to present to a steering committee, when you have to present to a board meeting, Basically, in any case, you are on the agenda when you have to present to a meeting of people who are far your senior, or actually, you have to present in a situation which has some kind of unique weight, some kind of unique importance to your career. The poll is going to be about what you feel in such situations. Even a bit more precisely, we are asking about the proportions of two major feelings. When you know you have to deliver a presentation at a meeting on top management level, what do you feel? Rather fear or excitement? Fear in the most negative sense that you can use it and excitement in the most positive sense, like you are excited about doing your favorite sport. And of course you can answer, as you can see, or as you will see, excitement and fear in equal measure. Let's see how you feel. 
and the poll is open, please vote now. Can you guys vote? I don't see any votes coming in. I do. Yeah, it did pop up and we did vote. You do? Okay. Yep. Okay. Tell me, Tomas, when should we stop the poll? Well, we are nearing one full minute and now we have one minute. So actually we can stop here. Okay. Good. So as you can see, um, what I was expecting is true. You roughly feel excitement and fear in equal measure. And uh, honestly, the main point is not what is the good answer, as there is no good answer to this question, of course, but rather how to make the most out of these strong feelings and make it into an objectively successful presentation to your uh, actual audience. And this is what I'm going to talk about in, in the next 30 minutes, roughly. So first of all, prepare well about the audience, even the meeting site and the material that is expected from you. Uh, when we are talking about the meeting site, uh, you will be reminded of the words of Andrashis, who actually said that this whole material is essentially about the era which comes after the big virus lockdown. So we are going back to live meetings, at least for the discussion in this seminar. Honestly, some of the online uh, points can be also used from this uh, experience, including the little disturbance you just, uh, you just saw. But uh, essentially, I believe more in going into a meeting personally and trying to convince people in person. The second point will be about making your message concise and easy to grasp. And we'll see some uh, practical examples about it. In delivery, I would suggest that everybody focuses on the chairperson in the room. This may sound a bit controversial or a bit, well, uh, submissive, but we'll see why. And last not least, please try to leave no open problems behind, but do follow up if you have to. Understanding the difference between your position and the audience's position. When you enter a meeting room, you may expect something like this. Here I am about to enter the stage with a capital S. Well, often you'll find something like this instead. Let's be honest, it is a bit hard to start when you see the picture on the right hand side, especially if you had been expecting the one on the left. And this is why I'm talking about understanding the difference because, well, it does lead to some kind of degree of success if you at least expect what you actually can get. So in a bit more detail, what can be the differences about your viewpoints? You are eager to share your results, excited as we have seen in the, in the poll. They are tired of too many agenda items. You are competent in all the details that you are going to cover. They might be totally ignorant in your subject matter. And mark my words, this is not totally negative. It is not their job to be as much of a technical subject matter ex expert as you are. Still, there is a big difference. You are in need of direction and decisions. That's why you go to a steering committee or a board meeting, essentially. While they might be afraid of problems and decisions, especially when it's N plus one on the list. You might be unaware of events and plans that are in other parts of the organization, while they just possibly might be focused on some other bigger issue in the organization. So, Maybe these are exaggerations, but there is a kernel of truth in all of these differences, and it is worth preparing for the worst case and then trusting a good outcome. So how can you train your empathy a little bit? Just try to go through these real life situations where actually any of you might have found yourselves in. 
How does it feel to you when at the end of a tiring day, your small child comes to you to talk about how successful he was in a game that he played that day? How do you feel when an elderly owned calls you up right in the middle of hurrying to a meeting where you are late, which you are late for and wants help, but you cannot really help her? Or just simply, how does it feel when you are sitting in a movie, you watch an endless series of trailers and advertisements, and then when you think the movie is just about to begin, one more trailer begins. Well, at this point, you might ask, oh, so is it then all hopeless? Does it feel for them always this negative as these kind of real life situations feel for us? Well, no, the situation is not hopeless. Otherwise, we wouldn't do this training. And anyway, real life situations vary a lot and you may be a bit lucky as well. More importantly, you can come out a winner if you prepare. And anyway, think through these situations. You do have a chance to actually feel proud at the end if you do listen to this small child and actually you do understand the kind of game that he's talking about. Or you may find out how you help your own and actually finish the day with a little good deed. Or there is a chance that if you do watch that one extra trailer, you may get impressed with the movie. It just depends a very, it depends a lot on, on how those calls for help, how those presentations, if you like, went in these cases. And this is what we all are here to discuss, how to make the most out of it. First of all, just let me clarify that usually there is a clear distinction between two kinds of presentations that you might do for a top management level. Either you want to get approval for a change, like extra funds, another team member, some kind of reorganization, or you simply want to leave behind the feeling of all goes well. Most of the cases, the second, um, second is true, but the first is a bit harder to do uh, as, as, as everyone who is in the audience now and has already experienced such a case can witness. But anyway, the key point is to understand yourself, for yourself, what do you want to get out of the situation? An approval for a change or just all goes well? And in both cases, the same four points will apply that we already have covered, but let's reiterate, prepare well about the audience, the meeting site and the material, make your message concise and easy to grasp, in delivery focus on the chairperson in the room and leave no open problems behind, but do follow up. Preparation is 80% of your success. We have this little picture of the moon here. And well, while not as much of an alien territory as the moon, but believe me, you will be landing in alien territory when you enter that room. Just think back of the opera site and the site that actually um, you encounter when, in, when going into the meeting. So you, you will be landing in alien territory. What can you do? What did those do who wanted to land on the moon? They're prepared. So please do prepare as much as possible about the participants, the site and the materials. In a bit more detail, let's go through what I would suggest you do in preparation. And when I say what I would suggest to do, um, I would underline a general caveat, a general warning, if you like. All of this is really based on personal experience but the price to pay in this situation is that it is my personal experience, meaning it may be different for others. It may be different for you personally. This is really just a list of ideas that you might treat as a menu. Audience. First of all, you should know who is going to be in the room. This sounds like, you know, very, very basic. However, it is not always the case that you actually know who are the members of a committee. Even more important, you should know who the chairperson is. And by saying you should know, I include knowing how they look. This is absolutely normal that you might not know, let's say at N minus three level, you might not know how the CIO of a company looks. Thank Google, it's not too hard now to actually find out but it is something of an embarrassment if you don't know that you are actually speaking to a person you should be aware of uh, the position of and this is actually 
easy to avoid, it's easy to avoid if you know how they look. Peer experience, meaning if you know anybody in the organization who did, just did the same kind of job like you did, who already presented a quarterly controlling report or whatever um, works team in, in a steering committee setting, talk to them. Please ask them what, what were their experiences, especially what are the habits in these meetings? Because if these meeting participants hate something, then it is to be disturbed in their habits. If they always have paper handouts, let them have paper handouts. If they never have Q&A, don't push for a Q&A, and so on. So try to figure out what are the habits. Friends and foes. So those who like them, like each other uh, in, the, in the room, and those who don't like each other that much. Obviously, this is sensitive territory. You shouldn't uh, inquire about it in a um, too open way. But definitely, for example, if there is a peer experience to build on, it's good to learn who is on whose side and who are definitely not on the same side. Don't overuse this knowledge, but it will help you to understand, for example, why some of the questions are a bit more aggressive than the others at the end. Technical competence. As I said, most likely they will not know that much about your subject matter. However, usually there is someone who does and you should find out who that person is especially because once again the questions on the questions level this might be uh, important to know and uh, last but very not least something uh, i learned in my consulting background or in my consultant years try to arrange for a pre-meeting this is a bit harder to do if you're inside an organization i know but still if you can somehow manage, especially before a really important meeting, to get a chairperson and your boss in the same room and have a little bit of a pre-meeting for the three of you just to test the key messages, well, that's halfway to victory, if not more. Okay, the site. Um, once again, I suppose we are talking about a physical room. So if you can go to that room before you actually do your presentation. Once when you can go in alone, it will help you understand a lot. And if you picture it full with people, then you will have an easier start and less of a fear when you actually enter. Check the te technical setup. It's an um, important point which we have just made, although it also was shown that no matter how many, tr how many uh, trials you, you go for, error can always be there. So at least do know whether there are mics for speakers or you speak without the mic, whether there are projectors for slides or you don't use any, or you check uh, whether there's a monitor. If in some settings flip charts are used, you better know whether they are there or not, and there are any pens to write with. So make sure that technology gets in your way as little as possible. And I would include in technology a strange thing, chairs the physical chairs, not the chairperson. Try and sit on them. Try and sit on one of the chairs. You will actually understand better how you will physically look like and how you will physically feel when you do the presentation. And also you can avoid the comedy scene where you sit into a chair and then it collapses under you because you forgot that your weight is a bit more than it usually carries. So the point is, test the chair. And also check where you actually wait for being called into the meeting because that's a space where you will need some privacy and at least in my case, you will definitely need some water. Also, once again, the point of advice is know what you need. If um, you are more relaxed, if you chat with someone before you enter that room, do that although I would usually suggest a bit of calm and a bit of being alone. Okay, and then materials. So what should you talk about and what should you bring with yourself as a presentation material? First of all, here expectations are paramount. So please clarify whether it's PowerPoint or Word, whether they need any or not. And uh, if there is any material to be done, then I would suggest a slide as opposed to a Word and a one slide exec executive summary, maximum three slides. 
there is a good reason to think that this will be all that you can actually show. And this will be the slide or the three slides that you go through in the presentation. If you have support material, that's actually very good to do, uh, especially if you want some change after the presentation, because then you have to have numbers and facts ready, but don't expect to actually distribute them and most of the time don't, don't even expect to get to the point where support material can be shown. Now, um, E really, um, we have written here as little technology as possible. Uh, because whatever can go wrong can go wrong in a presentation and uh, honestly it is a little easier to hand out some executive summary sheets on paper than uh, somehow actually uh, working out what the executive summary uh, sheets would look like if the screen would be on which is not. Hello again. In the meantime, I actually took some water, so I'm fine and I can focus now into the camera again. Make your message concise and easy to grasp. Well, you can always say that uh, the Mona Lisa on the left-hand side looks a little bit better than the version on the right-hand one. But to be honest with you, most of these present in most of these settings, the presentation they expect from you are closer to the right-hand side drawing than to the left-hand side painting. Actually, they usually don't do any preparation. That's already a point because they have a lot of agenda points and maybe some of them are a bit even more important than yours. Or simply, it was a bit late when they got the whole material for the meeting. This is the typical case, by the way. So if there is no preparation, it's hard to build on something from their side, I mean. So rather, please focus on the key messages which don't really need any preparation from their side. From their side. Similarly, you should only briefly explain history and background, reason being that usually you get lost in it. Most people talk about, for the most part, in their presentation, what they begin with. So if you begin with history, you will talk about history for a lot. And that shouldn't be the case. If your key message is we are okay, you remember this kind of leaving a good feeling behind, then show what you have already achieved. This is very important. Make sure that it's clear that you actually have done something, not just you are okay, meaning you have a chance to show how hard you worked with this project or in that organization unit. We will see some examples of how to show those results and how to show them in a way that they actually got it at the end. If your key message is we need, we need a change, then please take seriously the preparation of supportive material. We discussed that because yes, there might be a case where a smart question comes back about the numbers and the actual forecasts and what this change would entail in cost and so on. You can even use a seed model here, a little bit of advertisement, place commercial here. We have the seed model of motivational factors. Now, if you know the audience members and you try to prepare for their questions or their general approach or attitude, well, these motivational factors can help because that means you can have an easier view of who will ask about, for example, numbers and who rather about the fit of your suggested change with the whole of the organization and so on. Not easy to do, but try not to say anything in this kind of setting, which was not pre-agreed with your immediate superior, with your boss. It's sometimes just a situation of looking at this person rather than answering the question or rather than going into a detail that you have not discussed. Please, this is rather from the second part of my experience uh, in these presentations. It can be very, very, um, at least disturbing for audience members when there is somebody who is presenting something and then there is a kind of taking it half back kind of comment from, from their superior in the meeting. So please try to stick with what you agreed on beforehand. And if you finish a bit early, no one will complain. 
Okay, so here we have just a little bit of example list of how to explain things to top management. You might write by yourself that 97.72% of customers have been identified remotely or in person, and by the end of phase one, 100% seems to be a feasible target. That's a normal thing to write in a project report. But please simply say, we know practically all our customers by now. We will know all of them in one month as planned. Or instead of retooling schedules have been updated and tightened in the light of recent regulatory changes related to emission levels, please say, they just made the rules tougher. We can comply as there was some slack in the time plan. Expect no fines. This is a magic sentence for top management. Let me tell you, expect no fines. Or instead of IT downtime due to core system replacement is expected to fall under the predefined 0.05% threshold after milestone seven, try simply saying from next Monday, those annoying little messages will get off your screens. Okay, so if you deliver, who you deliver to? And this is where I'm coming to my point about focus on the chairperson. Most of the settings will not look like this hopefully. However, the message is, I hope, clear and concise. Please try to focus on the person who is chairing the meeting. Why? Because in a short meeting of strangers, eye contact matters most. But if you are presenting to a whole body of people, to an actual meeting audience, well, you simply cannot look at all of them. So if you have to decide, you should decide with looking at the chairperson. Second most, you should look at your boss, sometimes around and very rarely to your notes. In delivery, you should be clear and confident. Of course you say, but how to do that? Well, there are two easy tricks. Your greeting and your first short content sentence should be pre-written and please learn it by heart. Sounds like overdoing it, but believe me, when you are in the situation you start speaking, you might even not remember the official name of the project you are presenting. So learn it by heart. Similarly, put together a closing sentence and the farewell term and learn it by heart or write it down for yourself, but essentially make, make it sure that you know how you are going to finish. Now, one more controversial idea, maybe. Please avoid presentation tricks and jokes. Roughly in every presentation training, there is an idea of how to do presentation tricks. Here, you won't have any. These are simply too risky. You don't know enough of the audience. You might hurt some feelings. You might find out something that you don't, didn't want to find out. Please don't make it memorable in this sense because the chances for success are very slim. Speak louder and faster. Practically, this always helps, meaning practically after a while, everybody starts to speak a bit too low and a bit too slowly. So actually, usually if you remind yourself to turning up the volume and putting in a bit more speed, it helps. Check if they are listening because you can. I mean, just look around as, as we discussed sometimes. Also from the noise or any other normal sign, you can actually gather that the audience is somewhere else. If this is really becoming frustrating, then look at your boss and then the chairperson. One thing you shouldn't do is trying to put the room in order. This is not the situation where, where you should try that. It's a bit like the tricks and jokes. It might be memorable, but it's never sure that it's going to be memorable in the wrong or the right way. Fourth, don't leave open problems behind. If top management members dislike something, it's having one more open problem. Try to create the feeling that the Rubik's cube is in order, like you can see it in this little photograph, that all the sides are the same color and you already did your job and it is going to be a logical consequence that all the other three sides also are in order. However, don't lie. 
if by some magic the other three sides are not in order, don't say so. In more practical terms, if there is a risk about your project, if there is a risk in your proposal, then do acknowledge it. Show your plan how to mitigate it. Don't say there is no such risk. Don't say it will not happen. And don't lie to the second commandment of the same essential message is that you should not make up an answer. If you don't know the answer, promise to come back with it. I would suggest that don't even try to estimate something. The reason why is that these estimates are usually more sticky than the real answers. The psychology behind is most likely the fact that people are listening more when there was a question, when there is an open problem of whether this number is this or that, and then you come up with an estimate, then estimates are actually more sticky than normal numbers in the presentation. And that might be a problem later. So essentially try to avoid giving any answers that you are not sure of, rather promise to come back with them. Make the end as orderly as the whole presentation. So usually there is a question about questions, but this should not be your question. Usually it should come from the chairperson of the meeting. If a question does come up, then look at your boss and try to establish who the two of you, who of the two of you should answer. 90% of the cases it will be you. Um, and even in the 10% of the cases where it's your boss, you should, you should rather stay alert because he or she might switch over to you at some point in giving the answer. Offer the follow-up that we discussed, offer the answers to the questions that, which were raised and where no clear um, answer was given in the meeting. And uh, usually it's a good idea to have a memo of the agenda point distributed. If you ever promise to send something about the answers or a memo, then keep this promise and be fast. Try to do it latest by the end of the given week, because otherwise it will be actually worse than not promising and not delivering. At the end of the agenda point, wait politely when you are let off by the chair, so don't just jump up and leave. And if this does not happen, well, then after a while you can just leave the room, but normally chairpersons are, have, have the habit of letting people off their uh, agenda points. And ask your boss, for a feedback the next time you meet. So this is it. Essentially, what I'm suggesting to you is accepting the key difference. It is showtime for you, but another item for them. How to overcome this difference and how to make it successful for you, make it a success for you. As I said, try to prepare well about the audience, about the site, and about the materials that you need. Make your message simple and easy to grasp. Deliver with confidence, focusing on the chairperson. And finally, leave no open problems behind and do your follow-up. And while we are at the end of this webinar, let me switch back to a real life story. Because I really hope that all these tools and maybe tricks can help you to turn your fear into excitement and your excitement into success. However, I have to also think back to a story where I was presenting almost 20 years ago. And uh, I think it was a situation that I will remember all my life. Actually, we were working for, a, as a consulting company, we were working for a bank and we had a proposal in front of a steering committee where there were two vice presidents of the bank, two VPs. Now, the proposal was essentially to move an organizational unit from one of them to the other. As you can guess, one of them was for the proposal and the other is against, other was against it. But what I did not expect was that actually it came to shouting in the room. These two VPs were cursing each other, calling names on each other. The total, there was a total chaos at some point and I just 
as a presenter had to look at the chairperson and, and basically asking for help in restoring order. Now, many, many uh, discussions later, uh, I have to also add that the proposal was accepted. One of the VPs has won, and let's put it simply, the other has lost. And now, after 20 years, I'm still great friends with one of these two VPs, with the one who lost. Because after all, presentation tricks and tools can only go so far. I would even say that achieving success in such organizational situations matters only so much. My personal farewell to you at the end of this webinar would be that uh, people count more and friends matter more. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Tomas. Uh, and now um, we look forward to receiving your questions. Please, you can either write us via the chat uh, icon or you can also uh, click on raise hand if you would like to ask your question in person with your voice and video on. Uh, and while the questions are arriving, uh, Tomas, let me, let me ask you maybe one or two questions about what we have discussed previously uh, this webinar and also, also you also raised these points during the webinar. Um, you talked about your boss being present and uh, in the situations where you, you should have an eye contact with your boss. Um, but what if, what if your boss takes over the presentation? What if he sort of steps in and takes the word from you? What would you recommend in that kind of situation? Uh, this does happen from time to time, and uh, in such cases, a similar thing applies than what we talked about when uh, discussing answering questions. You should obviously let your boss do it, um, but also stay alert. Don't don't lean back and don't don't say that okay the presentation is now done by this person, by my boss rather prepare for getting the kind of questions like, what is this number actually? Or how was the name again? And then you really have to be there to, to actually to do a bit more than what you would normally do as a presenter, because you have to answer a given question rather than doing it your way. So I would say, let them do it, but be always prepared to take back. Okay, thank you. Um, in the meantime, we have a question from Attila, who is asking about animations. You talked about tricks and jokes and so on. How do you look at animations? Are there the trick part of the presentation? Uh, so the question is, should you avoid animations and keep it as simple as possible? Or you may uh, use them in a sort of controlled manner? Well, I think um, I would usually avoid them. First of all, you can get a bit nervous. You push too many buttons too many times, then you get ahead of the animation, then it's harder to go back. So basically you just create some sort of extra danger for yourself. Second, um, what I definitely would be against is using sound in the sense of, uh, you know, actually adding some kind of uh, noise to the animations. I, I saw presentations like that and they are really, really annoying. So uh, I would minimize the use of animations and without any sound. What I do think can work is when actually you are talking about the same thing in more and more detail, then you can add layer on layer um, with an animation in a given case, like the floor plan of a building, let's say. But even here, I think it's a bit easier to simply insert a slide with one layer, then another with two layers, and then the third one. Okay, thank you. Um, a concrete question is coming from uh, Maria about uh, preparing and the preparation part and preparing about uh, the audience actually and what kind of personal differences they might have uh, among them. Um, so the question is, uh, 
how common it is to prepare for personal differences and, and how do you do it actually? Um, what is there sub, su such a technique that you go after these uh, uh, things? Uh, how, um, and um, because, you know, there's a possibility of crossing the limits of professionalism uh, when you are trying to investigate. Mm. That's true. Uh, that's, that's, that's why I started this part with saying, and now this is very sensitive, because it is sensitive. Um, I would rather say that, you know, you can always ask questions about the topic that you are going to present in terms of, let's put it that way, normal organizational um, interest. I'll say an example. Uh, then asking like, uh, aren't we afraid that that guy will just, you know, kill the project? So what I mean by this normal organizational thing is that, for example, you suggest a change in the deadlines of the project. And then you can ask around together with your boss or just on a peer level, whether this deadline shift would really endanger anything from the point of view of another organization or unit. Like uh, you are suggesting a change in the uh, moving plans of your office building while IT has a plan for changing the core system. Now, how can your deadline change affect them? Possibly they're gonna be happy because they are late anyway, but uh, normally this is a question you can ask without asking, is IT an enemy? And if the answer, if the answer will come back that well, they are fed up with, let's say, back office because this is the N plus one time that such a deadline change comes up and you are not the first to suggest such a thing, da, da, da. then you will already feel that, well, there is some kind of um, real bad feeling about this and it is more than just a timeline shift. So basically ask the questions in an objective way and then listen well to the meaning behind the answer or Maybe some people will simply tell you the meaning behind the answer right away and say that, well, you know, there is anyway a big, um, uh, a, a big difference between the opinions of, of IT and you. So essentially ask like it's just a normal question and then prepare for a loaded answer. Okay, there are some good uh, technical questions coming in, uh, some really practical ones which are quite interesting. What if, uh, although you said that you might ex experience the case when half of the people are sleeping when you enter, what, what if you have some active people in the room? So a question from Kotlin is, 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 uh, is saying, or, or ask, Kotlin is asking that, what if you have people that are commenting all the time, adding sentences or comments to your points, uh, which means that you are running out of time at the end and you are not able to make the progress you are aiming for. Uh, so the question is, whose role is to make some order uh, in that sort of uh, situation to sort of keep the momentum and keep the progress? That's an excellent question. Uh, I, I think this is, uh, this is coming up very often. And uh, I think the answer is similar to the one that I suggested about the uh, general lack of attention. Uh, just the other way around. Um, if there is, okay, first of all, try to incorporate the comments. Most people are happy to hear their wordings, their ideas back. So if you can say that, just like we heard, there is even more of a reason to add some funds to this project because da la la, then it is obviously a very, very nice gesture. There is only so much that you can do in this, but uh, at least the first three or four times in a presentation, you can incorporate what you're told. If it's really getting out of hand and if, if your time is really up or you feel that you cannot just get to the point, then uh, the way to go is to look first at your boss, who I suppose in this setting is usually at the same level as those who are making these active comments or this person's boss, if that's the right level. So somebody on the same level as the meeting participants, essentially looking them into the eye and making it clear that you would like to go on. And if this does not work, then there is still the chairperson as the gold reserve. Okay, but you shouldn't sort of uh, keep them in order and say, okay. No, 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 please don't. I mean, uh, this is really, I, I know this sounds very hierarchical and whatever, but uh, 
if you want to be successful, then in most organizations in our part of the world, uh, I think you're, you're doing yourself a favor by not putting the room in order. Okay. And um, actually, it's a question from Shandor uh, is about, uh, uh, which is also interesting uh, and uh, a bit linked to the previous question is, is there a best way or a technique that you would recommend to present suggestions that you know that is going to be unpopular with the audience? So mm -hmm. how would you sort of wrap it up or wrap it in? Um, uh, do you have any uh, uh, tips or tricks on that? Well, um, yes, I think if you do find yourself in a situation that you have to come up with an unpopular suggestion, then you must have a good reason for that. Um, also because normally you would not, you know, want to use this rare occasion to meet top people to leave behind the memory of, you know, bringing the bad piece of news. Uh, there is always the saying of not, let's not shoot the messenger, but believe me, the messenger will be the face of the problem if there is a problem. So first of all, you should have a good reason to actually do the suggestion or make the suggestion. Now, if you do have a reason, which is sometimes the case, then start with the reasons. So make it you know, clear that there is some kind of problem to be solved and uh, make it as objectively measured and as really neutrally described as possible. And then if you sense in the room that there is some kind of nodding or at least you know the faces of people who cannot deny something which is too obvious then you can make the suggestion because then it is sort of an answer to a question which was not asked this is this is what you can do obviously it will not you know win all the wars uh, an unpopular suggestion is always an unpopular suggestion but at least if you can agree on the grounds agree on the facts that make it in in unavoidable to 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 uh, make this suggestion then it is harder for them to refute it or at least it's harder for them to react emotionally that's what okay. i would suggest start with the reasons okay and, and what would you do if uh, one of the uh, uh one of the, one, one guy or or lady becomes maybe too aggressive with you uh uh and uh, and attacking you what 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 would you what could you do then as a middle manager well uh, try to stick with the facts and try not to recipro reciprocate this kind of uh, aggressive behavior um, and this is this is actually not because of your hierarchical position or whatever uh, this is true of any situation in life that usually if you get into a vicious circle of aggressiveness and then an answer to aggressiveness with aggressive voice then you end up with the two losers so um, try to keep calm try to stick to the facts try not to even realize that there is some aggressive personal part in what they are saying and then in most of the cases even the other members of the audience will feel so embarrassed and so awkward that they will try to calm down the person who is, who is aggressive. Uh, this is really true for a, a lot of situations that after a while, like for the third answer that you give and you still get back that personal attack, it will be more of an embarrassment for the other audience members than for yourself. And they will sort of collectively uh, look at this person and try to, try to make them shut up. Mm -hmm. Stay calm. <laughs> Essentially, that was the answer. Stay calm. Yeah, um, maybe maybe another technical question. Uh, um, you you also mentioned that uh, at especially at the at the beginning at at, at the end, you should uh, open and close with some sentences that you learn by heart. Um, do you have any tips on on what these sentences should be or how they should be formed or formalized? Well. There's nothing special because, as I said, th this should not be, you know, the biggest quotes of the history of economics or something. This should be simply 
ladies and gentlemen, if that's the way to address them, or dear colleagues, whatever. I mean, now we are into language things, which are obviously different in English and Hungarian and whatever other languages uh, the audience may speak. But essentially, the, the message is make up your mind. So if it is ladies and gentlemen, then keep it ladies and gentlemen. If you want to say dear friends, say dear friends. But the important point is know what you want to say. And uh, really, I think most of us have been already in a situation where they, for example, had to introduce somebody to somebody else who they actually knew very well. And for that moment, especially if they were on a stage, they forgot the name. You know what I'm mm -hmm. thinking of? And this is the kind of thing that you want to avoid. I mean, make sure you really learn by heart the official name of the project. Um, just a very, very simple uh, example that just, you know, somehow came to my mind that uh, the whole world knows about this tragic um, pair of uh, the Prince of Wales and, uh, and, and Diana, the Princess of Wales, where actually at the wedding, Diana said the names of his uh, husband-to-be in the wrong order. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the kind of example I want to give, that if you are really excited or fearful or both, you can really make mistakes that are, are uh, hardly imaginable if you are in a normal life situation. So this is why I'm saying try to figure out what you want to say and start with those two sentences. A greeting and something about the content. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, and I would like to ask the audience to, if you have any further questions, to send us uh, an email after this webinar. As usual, you will get a, uh, an email, a follow-up email following this session um, with all the details. And of course, um, just like the previous ones, um, this, this session was recorded and will be available on our website together with the slides uh, of today. And uh, now thank you, Tomas, for, for moving on. Uh, and now this is the time when I would like to again ask for your opinion about how much did you enjoy today's session. So between uh, one, on a scale of one to seven, please select a number now. Thank you very much. Okay, for some reason, I'm not seeing the poll now. So I'm asking Tomas if you can see how much, what is the percentage of voters? 90% uh, voted, so we can wait for 10%. Okay, let me know when it stops and then I end the poll. <laughs> sure. Sort of technical bug on, on our last event, the technical issues <laughs> came in, but I think we, all in all, we, we managed well so far. So should I, I so, but we couldn't convince the last three participants to vote. So I think you can end the vote. Okay. Okay. And um, so thank you again. And um, I do hope that you enjoyed our webinar series. Uh, and um, uh, if you if you did, uh, we of course hope to see you on our programs, uh, on our leadership and uh, management programs, or our international executive MBA that we are launching during the fall. You may find all the details on our website. You can see the link here. Um, so we look forward to welcoming all of you on one of our programs in in the near future. So thank you again for your uh, attention throughout these eight weeks uh, from beginning of May until today. And I wish you a very relaxing summer. Stay safe and take care of yourself and your families. So thank you again and bye-bye.